three, two, one. We have a new NBA champion. All right, here we go. Another edition of Knicks fans of the round table, special edition Knicks fans of the round table, CP from Knicks fan TV. And on tonight's episode, we're going to celebrate the championship Knicks. Yes, championship and yes, Knicks sir. do go hand in hand. And, and 50 years ago, the Knicks did win their first championship. And on tonight's round table, I want to talk to the fans who experienced it, who lived through that uh, that joyous occasion and that joyous team. So uh, without further ado, let, let's start the round table. Uh, Marty, I'll start with you. Just introduce yourself and, and how you became a Knicks fan. What was your earliest recollection? Of, Thank of you, Steve, CP. Absolutely. So uh, Marty Fox, a uh, lifelong New Yorker, uh, grew up in Brooklyn, Queens, live on Long Island right now. Uh, I'm also a technologist by profession. Uh, I came to the Knicks when I was about 11 years old. I loved the Knicks right from the beginning. Um, Walt Bellamy was my first favorite player. My brother's favorite player was Dick Barnett. Uh, and, you know, I've had the whole ride from championship right up to now, and I'll never change. Uh, next up, we have Jeff. Jeff, how's it going, man? I'm good, CP. It was nice. It's nice talking to you. Thanks for joining I us. I was, I was about Marty's age, I think 12, when we went to a, my dad. We had season seats. I think it was section R, row A, seats one and two, right behind the basket. First row, we had two in the third row. Um, just became a fan, really, coincidentally, when Clyde came into the league. But I loved that team. I mean, that team was all about New York, like you and I discussed a lot of New York teams had success that year, but there were none better than that with the drama and the players and the stories. Obviously, Clyde was my favorite. I loved Willis. I loved Nate Bowman and Dave Stallworth and Johnny Warren and Dave the Busher. I mean, we could go through the pack, but um, I cannot have the allegiance now that Marty, like Marty does. I don't like, you know, Dolan and I don't like what's going on, but man, I love that team and I loved them until about, I'd say, 77 or 78 kept up kept up with them still rooted for him mm. but didn't have the same love and gil how's it going gil yeah doing good doing good uh my name is gil duff i'm uh here in nashville tennessee which is uh my hometown born and raised here but did live in uh the new york area in manhattan and in uh fairfield county connecticut for about 20 years but i'm back here in nashville now uh my first experience uh with the Knicks is really one of my first experiences with the NBA and prof for professional sports in general. I I'm about the same age as these other guys, about 10 years old. And back in that time in the day, I don't know if this was the case everywhere, but certainly in Nashville, uh, the playoffs weren't on network TV. And mm -hmm. uh, I started watching the playoffs in the first round on tape delay. And they kept, yep. the game came on about 1030 central time after the news. And the first round that year was against the Hawks, the Atlanta Hawks. And I had seen being from Tennessee, Nashville, I had seen uh, Pistol Pete Maravich play for LSU against Vanderbilt. My dad had taken me to see him. So that's what initially got me watching it. And I stuck with it every night, didn't miss a game, 10 years old, you know, watching all the tape delay games. Up, up to and including the uh, dramatic uh, championship in, in Game 7 against the Lakers. And uh, just as it so happens, several players with Tennessee connections, both the University of Tennessee right. as well as Tennessee State, uh, were, became Knicks. Became Nick. The Bernie and Ernie show. The That's Bernie right. and Ernie show, Dick Barnett, Anthony Mason, Alan Houston, on and on. And so uh, – I have always been a Knicks fan. and was a Knicks, Knicks fan there in the mid-90s and the 2000s when I was living in the New York metro area. Uh, a lot of Knicks rooted in Tennessee, man. So it's very interesting That's to right. see your origins as a fan started in Nashville, Tennessee, way back when. So that, that's very interesting. Uh, Jeff, I'll go back to you. I know you had said Clyde was your favorite player. Who was Clyde as a player and, and ultimately as someone who you grew a, a relationship with? Man, from the moment I met him, he was very nice to me. I remember going up to the Statler Hilton, and he had a 
or rack like they have in the department store with a whole lot of clothes. He was even Clyde back then. And his roomie was Mike Reardon, who needless to say was the salt of the earth. Clyde would leave the window uh, closed, Mike would open it, he'd be cold. But I remember Clyde's apartment on 54th Street. I don't know if you guys remember, they did a special on him way back in the day. And he had a little glass emplatement on the wall with his name and script and he had a big round uh, mirror in the ceiling above the bed. And I'd go to his apartment and I'd say, what's wrong with you, man? You know your name, people know your name when they come in here. What do you need all this stuff for? And when he took me to camp when I was about, I don't know, 14 or 15, we drove up in his red Eldorado and there was change on the floor that was almost ankle high. And I said, why don't you put this in a bank or why don't you do something with it? Oh man, that's chump change. <laughs> and to, to me, Clyde said, I think one of the toughest guys, you guys, I don't know if you'll believe it or not, but one of the toughest guys he guarded because he disliked them so much was Mike Newland. He said, Mike Newland was a dirty ball player and he came out of the game with bumps and bruises. But the more Mike Newland tried to be physical with him, Clyde would just tear him up. You know, there were other guys, Archie Clark and, I mean, you know, you guys know you're all my age, but I can't. I remember going up to Harlem with him. And his, that was when he had a Rolls Royce. His chauffeur's name was David. I mean, I've no, I've no, I sent you some pictures. I still know Clyde to this day. Been to his restaurant. He held my grandson. He was very nice to my son. The guy is aces, man. And, you know, the funny thing about Walter, that's why I don't call him Clyde, I call him Walter. He was very shy after he quit basketball. Mm. And this came upon him and he would read. He would read every day to get knowledge of verbiage. That's why you hear him say gliding and whatever, you know, just the rhyming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's a fantastic guy. I was also, you know, a Clyde guy. Mm -hmm. But I'll throw in two guys that, that he might have had a couple nightmares with. And one was the Pearl. And Gil, one was right. Pistol Pete, who I love yep. Pistol Pete. Yeah. Uh, I actually went to the New York Post and I had them send me everything on Pistol Pete when I was a kid, because there was no internet or anything. It was hard to get information, but uh, Clyde as well. And I think that Clyde was so important, not only to the Knicks, but the league in general. I mean, if he didn't come through in, in game seven and did what he did, the NBA probably would not be what it is today, but because you guys know before the 69 season, when the Knicks really, really took everything by the bull by the horns, and they were on the cover of Newsweek and other places, the NBA was, was not quite as big. Um, I mean, the ABC, I think, had paid like $350,000 for their TV contract a few years before. But, you know, Clyde, for so many reasons, just the way he, he shared the ball, just the way everybody on the team was important, okay? Uh, uh, Mike Reardon coming in and giving a foul, you know, I mean, give one mic. Right. And, 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 you know, he just got the ball to people where they could make the right play. But then, you know, after all of that, we can go into that about getting Bradley in the corner, the bush and out, bush are out high and moving the ball. Mm. But even after that, the first sneaker contract was, was Walt Frazier with mm. Puma. And, you know, the guy, and he still has a sneaker contract. That's a great with, point. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so, like, Zion Williamson, MJ, they owe it to him. And the other thing is, right. if, he does, if he doesn't help win that game seven, the NBA is probably not what it is today. So, yeah. Clyde, for all of the right reasons. I'll tell you a quick one. Mm -hmm. um, we were out. At, I don't know if you guys went to the games. Right around the corner was Harry M. Stevens. And all, a lot of the players came in after the game. And one night, well, I was in there. Not I. I was with my family, with Walter. And we were just chatting. And this person comes up and is is just oh you know when this was this was after he broke the record when he i think it was 19 assists in game seven and they said you just broke oscar robertson's record and he never cursed and he pulled me next to him and he whispered in my ear f oscar you know <laughs> but, and he never cursed and he respected all the players of that ilk but you know he told it like it was i remember long after that there was a, a gentleman young kid who was telling him about Jordan, 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 Jordan. Look what he would do to you. You couldn't guard him. Walt has a big ego. He's very calm and very, his demeanor is not like a big egotistical guy, but he just told the kid like this. After the kid went on for about 10 minutes, he said, son, you've never seen me play. You yeah. don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. You know, Clyde was, hey man, with that turnaround jump shot and picking people's pockets. And absolutely. You know, the guy was absolutely, he's one of the top 50, obviously it's in the, in the yeah. books. 
but he was the prototypical guard, unselfish, scored if he had to, yeah. played defense, rebounded. And, you know, even though he was like the, a very quiet guy, man, you could beat him up and he would take it and go back for more. Gil, I know you had a, a good Clyde story as well. He certainly had an impact on, on your fandom at an early age. Yeah, he certainly did. So uh, when I wasn't uh, watching these playoff games in 1970, I was in my driveway shooting hoops with, uh, with myself and my, my neighbor, my next door neighbor, who was about the same age. And we were probably shooting well into the night until that tape delay came on. And Clyde and Dick Burnett, those were kind of players that at our age – we could pretend we were them, you know, try to replicate their shots. Um, you know, uh, certainly the Marty had mentioned Puma, you know, had to, had to have those Puma Clyde. Uh, I still have them. <laughs> wait, wait, the original so ones? Yeah, you have the original Puma Clydes. No, the original Puma Clydes yeah. had an orange and green. These are white Puma Clydes yeah. newer. I'm sorry, Gil. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you. Yeah, well, I, had, I definitely had the original. So. Yes. And as yeah. you guys know, back then, you know, most most everybody wore Converse All Stars. That's and, right, Chuck uh, Taylors. Then mentioning uh, Maravich, I started wearing Pro Cats, but then when Clyde signed with Puma, I had to have those as well. But a, a funny story, uh, thinking about being out shooting hoops in the backyard. Do you remember Dick Barnett used to kick his legs up under Ball his back baby. butt? Wallback Ball Ball back baby yeah. jumper. And yeah. uh, <laughs> we would all, uh, we would try to see if we could do that. And, mimicking him as well so there were so many kind of great ways you could model those guys with their charisma their skills their talent I'll also I I I, I think I probably came to appreciate him more later but Willis Reed man I mean not not only what he did in that in that seventh game but just the fact that he went head-to-head -head with Chamberlain with Will throughout that uh that season. and don't forget Jabari and Kareem man. how about Kareem in the Buck series as well yeah, yeah. Well, he, he was unbelievable. I think he was a rookie that year. He had Bobby Dandridge there, if you guys remember him. Yeah, he was John a really Franklin. good. Yeah, they had real, some really good ball players. He had this, you know, his hook was unbelievable. I mean, he, he was just, he was just, you know, one of the best players ever. Um, you know, with the Lakers, he found his championships. Exactly. And so he was guys like Nate Thurman and Wes Unsell. Uh, that's why I don't watch as much basketball guys because back then you had real centers real tough guys now it's all three points and dunking honestly but you think about go. willis he was undersized versus he was, he was six nine versus all You're right. yeah so but he yeah. used that go ahead Bill. I'm sorry. no i was just gonna say i think he used his he knew how to use his body for as leverage against those guys and plus it was a combination of the talent and the heart and the soul yeah well, you guys uh, remember the story warrior. about willis with the uh, against the warriors when he knocked out Rudy LaRussa and guys got off the bench and came up to him and he says, I'll take you off. They were scared of him. He would have taken them all on. Willis was really a tough, tough guy. Yeah. Wow. Marty, how about you? What was, uh, what did Willis mean to you and, and what do you feel like Willis meant to, to the city? The heart and the soul, as, the, as right. the guys said, he never backed down. I mean, you know, he played against guys that were bigger than him, even though, even with a, uh, with a Chamberlain, you know where he did his uh, where he did his dip shit. Well, I mean his dipper. <laughs> but Willis would take him out of position. That's what Willis was great at. And the other thing about Willis, because he wasn't quite their size, he used it to his advantage. He was really smart, like like all of the Knicks. They were very smart. They became successful later in life. So many of them, like we talked about Barnett, but every single one of them. But, you know, Willis, even the first two shots that he hit against Chamberlain, yeah, yeah. you know, one was from around the free throw line, the other was on the wing, but he didn't come out to cover him. So he was more mobile. He could blow by people when he had to. And the thing, and the other thing is that Clyde always got it to him in the right position. Well, you guys know the story of game seven, that when Willis came out, it was like 727, and the, the crowd went berserk, and everybody turned, even Chamberlain, and they had him psyched at that point. That's what Clyde said. When, they, when, they, when the Lakers stopped and they were watching, they figured, you know, what's Willis going to do? He hit those two jumpers. It was over. They were demoralized. You know, I mean, and don't forget game five when, when Willis got hurt. DeBusher and Stallworth fronting Chamberlain and getting backside help. And come on, man, that, that, they came up so big. If they didn't do that in game five, there's no game seven.
Yeah, Jeff, right. Jeff, when he goes down in game five, were, were uh, you at the game in game five? Are you there? Yeah. yeah. CP, I don't think you understand. For my, family, every... for my family and I, it was Tuesday and Saturday night, first and third row. It was a religion. And then nice. going out after the game and seeing the players. He yeah. actually crumpled. I told you, my seats were behind the basket, first and third row. When he crumpled, it was literally right in front of us, in front of everybody. And, I, and you knew, you knew, you could see when he got up. And he, I'll never forget the way he dragged his leg in game seven. Mm. I mean, th those were the two of the most exciting, emotional, dramatic sports events. I've, and I've been right. to a lot of sports events, all sports. That, that win takes the cake for me. When, yeah. when he goes down in five, did you guys even think they had a chance after that? My heart went in my stomach at that yep. point. But knowing this team and knowing Red Holzman, you know, the way he could coach, he was an amazing guy. And, you know, the way they could come together, I think we all felt there was still a chance out there. Is there a true you know, team? It was. And, you know, they gutted it up in game five. Yep. You know, Stallworth played a great game. And there's another great story for you. You had a heart attack at 25 yep. years old, sat yep. out a couple of years, and then he comes back to the Knicks. And then in game five, he puts on that performance. They locked up Chamberlain in the second half of, of that game. Um, but yeah, I actually thought they had a chance, but my heart was in my stomach at that time. Yeah, you, you know, you always have to root for your team and you feel like, like Marty said, with Holzman's ingenuity and Bradley's genius and DeBusher, those guys knew the game. Frazier, they knew the game and I thought they'd find a way. He told me, were they going to be able to beat Chamberlain in game five the way they did and then come out and get, get the way Willis came out, just psyched them beyond control. If you guys know it well. CP, if you read articles, and they said that Willis took the needle. Who told me? Was yep. it Dan Whalen? The needle was like, yeah, so big. I yeah. mean, if I had seen that, it would make me sick. And, yeah. and, and it numbed him up, and Willis came out. I mean, come on, man. You I mean, that's really a warrior right there. Yeah. Wow. So, so, when he, so when he comes out of the tunnel, and you're sitting there, Jeff, like, what did you even think was happening when, yeah, I'm sure the well, crowd saw it, everyone rose up? At first of all, we didn't know because everybody was standing up and looking into that corridor that leads onto the court. But then when you saw Willis, and Willis had a gate about him, like a walk. When you saw Willis and he came on the court and you saw Chamberlain and the Lakers stop and turn around, it was magical. And people were saying to themselves, well, we didn't even know if he was going to play. We thought maybe it was for inspiration. But I know that Willis said before the game, I forgot who he told. He says, oh, I'm going to play. He told Marv. He, he, he told Marv. Yeah. He told Howard Cassell also. But Marv didn't believe him, really. He said maybe he's going to think sit on the bench or something. Right. He saw his leg, dragging his leg. Unbelievable. G Gil, that was Gil, Gil, sorry, Gil, how about you? You're, you're well, no, I, I, on obviously, I wasn't there. I was watching it on TV. But Marty mentioned Howard Cosell knowing about it. That was probably one of the classic moment certainly in, in NBA broadcasting was the way Cosell handled that. And uh, I can't recall word for word, but I certainly have an emotional memory of the way uh, Cosell kind of played that uh, dramatically, kind of played the theater out in that moment. Oh, sure. Very cool. If, yeah. if you listened on the radio, so Marty, you remember this because you, when Marv says, here comes Willis. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you know, you know, I know that on TV, Chris Schenkel did it, I think, and I think right. Jeff Wyman, who was a great guy for many reasons. Mm -hmm. But uh, hearing Marv doing it on the radio, it's a funny story because we had tickets to a Met game that night, believe it or not. My brother was a big Willie Mays fan. And I, mm -hmm. when I heard it was going to get blacked out, I went to the game. Otherwise, I would have come up with a good excuse. But everybody had their radios there. And Willie Mays hit two home runs in the game off Gary Gentry, but I didn't even know what happened because Willie. But you're right, Marv was the voice of the voice of the Knicks, and mm -hmm. he's a 28 year old kid doing this by himself, no analyst next to him. But when he said, you know, first they thought Cassie, you were at the game, Jeff, but um, but they thought that Cassie was Willis. Right, that's now, right. Then they got disappointed, but the players kind of knew that Willis was going to come out. And then when he came out, I think it was 7:27. Yep. I mean, what a thunderous! It was so emotional. You think about it now, and like it gets to you, you get the chills. Yeah, I mean, I remember we used to stamp our feet on the. I don't know if you guys went to games, but stamp our feet on the, what was it, like the metal that yep. that was under the seats. And that night, 
It was the la- the guard was shaking. And the reason I love Willis is he was all you know he was all shot up to play. But I remember him putting his and I learned this from him when I play a bigger guy. Put your leg between his legs yeah. and your arm yeah. around his waist. And, I, yeah. and not only that, I remember him putting his, like, actually leaning his shoulder so he wouldn't be leaning on his bag leg. And I was, man, I, I, I cried that night just wow. because yeah. that guy, man, when I, I'll tell you real quick, when Willis was, the, was a big executive with the Nets, I was sitting in the stands and he came out because I wanted him to meet my family. He knew my family, but I'm talking about my in-laws. And he comes over to me. He did the same thing he used to do when I was a kid. He rubbed my head. I said, Cap, man, I'm an old man now. You're rubbing my head for good luck. He used to do that when I was 14, 15 years old. I loved Willis. He was, he, I loved Willis. Not, you know. Yeah. Guy from Bernice, Louisiana. Yeah. 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 You know who else was so important? Cassie Russell. You know, Cassie yeah. Russell, Cassie went down during the year, right? And Bradley took his place. Cassie could have started for any other team. There were, right. games, there were games that he, year that he dropped 25, he dropped 30. He was an unbelievable scorer. And, uh, and listen, he came off the bench. Remember the instant offense? Six man. I mean. Six oh, yeah. man. And yeah. he was amazing. So that's right. another guy that, you know, took it for the team, you know. Yeah. They were a unit. And yep. A beautiful unit. That's mm-hmm. right. Absolutely. And, and you mentioned Bill Bradley. I think his story uh, of most of the guys is, is quite interesting, you know, him being drafted out of Princeton to the Knicks, the rivalry between he and Russell, you know, Michigan and Princeton and the holiday classic yep, and all yep, of that. Yep, him, yeah. him leaving to go back to school to, to pursue Oxford. The road, the, the, to Oxford, uh, becomes a Rhodes Scholar, then comes back to the Knicks. Struggled a little bit, but as you said, Marty, he, he found his way kind of once Cassie um, went down with the injury. Um, talk a little bit about Bill Bradley and his impact on the team. Yeah, so Bill Bradley was the one cog when he – I remember when he came to the team and nobody knew what to expect, and I think he had a couple rough games right at the beginning. I mean, he was a great scorer in college. I think he has the top 11 spots for Princeton. They're in the next state over for me right now. But um, – and he dropped 52 – in the NCAA tournament, I think it was against, it might have been against Wichita. Um, a great, great scorer, but I wasn't sure if his game was going to translate to the pros, mm. you know. But he came in a few rough games, and I do feel with Bill Bradley is if he was on some other teams where they didn't share the ball like the Knicks shared the ball, yeah, he would have suffered. He would have suffered, and I don't mm. think he would have had the career. But he came around. What I remember in my mind is perpetual motion. Right. Moving without the ball. Moving with the, of the ball. If you got him, you know, maybe not quite out as far as the busher, but Frazier knew where to get him the ball, and they would swing it around, and he'd be, be in the corner, okay? I mean, it was lights out when he took the shot. So that another guy. Weird, just, I'm sorry. So, no, I'm sorry. So, so smart, like everybody else. Yeah, yeah he, he was the guy that really, um, with his mo- constant movement, you know, he, and he'll tell you he's an eccentric guy. But the way he moved, like baseline to baseline, and just kept moving. The guy was right. But you said it, Morty. Perpetual motion. And if you ever saw him shoot free throws, he makes some weird yeah. faces after you release the ball. <laughs> tell you, yeah. We used to joke about that. Yeah, yeah. Bill, how about you? Yeah, no, I I, I love Bradley, DeBusher, all of them, and I, I guess I would just say, one of the things that I've thought about throughout the years is that hey. This was a team, they would have been great no matter what city they were in, but they really kind of personified New York City. Right. Their diversity, their backgrounds, how they all came together. Absolutely. They had the, they had the talent, they had the chemistry, they had the charisma and personality, and Bradley being kind of an intellectual and everybody else. It was just such an interesting mix that, that I think uh, fit with, the, with New York City so well. You know, you mentioned Dave DeBusher and his story as well. I mean, all the stories and how they all came together, it's just it's perfectly made for the book and, and for the for the 30 for 30 that, that came out and all the documentaries that came out of them. But DeBusher, you know, a baseball player. Right. He, he, with the he, White Sox. Right, with the Sox. And then a player coach with his hometown Pistons. I mean, the whole player coach dynamic from, from a guy that never seen that before. Uh, obviously, I heard you know Bill Russell was a player coach for the Celtics, and obviously it was it was more common in sports back then. But then to get traded to the Knicks the year before that, it seemed like uh, it it allowed Willis to to really excel. Did you guys feel at the time of the trade that you know the Busher was kind of that that final piece for them to really make it make a run? I don't think the Busher got the exposure 
to know that. But I do know that when he that after it happened, everybody said he was the piece that gelled them together as also as a team, you know, as a unit. And and you know the thing that we're not discussing, guys were very friendly off the court. I mean, back then, like I think DeBusher used to go hunting with Willis and Bradley and DeBusher were very good friends. Clyde was really off to himself, but I mean, this was a team. They really enjoyed each other's company on and off the court for the most part. That's what I thought. Yeah. Well, I I, I had mixed emotions about DeBusher. I did feel that he was the missing link, but as I said, Bell's Bellamy was my favorite player. <laughs> and they gave up Howard. They gave up Howard Comines. Comines, yeah, yeah. Remember Butch Comines and yeah, sure. another guy in college. He was dropping over thirty a game. He was six one though. I remember. But you know what? I felt that when the Busher came, that was the guy they needed. The guy that would clean the boards. The guy that would, you know, he had the maturity about him, and the guy that could drain, you know, a shot from any distance. You know, even in those. In, in game seven and, you know, game five. I mean, he could shoot from long range. Right now, he'd have quite an average because he was shooting three You're not pointers good. before there were three pointers. Yeah. And he was very unselfish. Let's not forget, all these guys set picks for each other, you know, and, and played hard. And, hey, the, the Busher, like you said, cleaned the boards. But, you know, all those guys played back then. Each of those guys, I mean, Willis didn't handle the ball, obviously, but they all excelled in all the aspects of the game on that team, whether it was defense, you know, passing the ball, you know, like red yelling, see the ball all night, you know what I mean, on defense. I mean, that was a, that was the true team, was the epitome of team basketball and a team in the sense of the word, I think. And, and you mentioned Red Holtzman, and obviously during my time, I, I've, I've seen a, a couple legendary coaches in my day, Bill Parcells being one. Riley obviously didn't win one with the Knicks, came close, but he, you know, came with championship pedigree from the Lakers and so on with the Heat. And then also as a Yankee fan, I had Joe Torre. Um, talk about, you know, Red Holtzman and his ability to really get these guys to, to mesh and, and play it as one, as, as a unit and ultimately champions. I can't see uh, Red being like Phil Jackson and talking about Indians and natives and all that. But, you know, Red, Red, was, Red was a very emotional guy on the bench. He'd get angry. But the thing that I think made him a great coach was I, he would let the players play, but he also involved them in the decision-making of the team, whether it be how they're going to play the defense, you know, what plays they're going to run. He, he really involved them and players like that you know I think what do you guys think I think he was a player's coach I think right. everybody bought into his system I think if he told Phil Jackson and he didn't play 69 but if you tell Phil Jackson go out there end of the game remember when he used to guard yeah. somebody who was trying to inbound the balls with those arms and legs arms. <laughs> head and shoulders or, yeah or yeah or Mike Reardon I want you to go in there give a foul then we're going to take you out Mike Reardon was a really good ball player I mean he went to Baltimore afterwards and he was he was putting down like 16, 17 points a game. And he was tough as nails as well. You know, see the ball, of course, right. you know, play in the lanes. So it's not right. only your man you're responsible for. Know where the ball is. A lot of these guys weren't going to get backdoored very often because they understood what was happening out on the court. And he understood how to build a team. Nowadays, we want a lot of people want to buy a team. And you can't do that. It's the teams now, as you said, Jeff, you know, the teams that, have teamwork and they play as a unit and you have the right people and you have sharing ball players like you know zion williamson he'll share the ball you know the certain people that the ball goes out on the wing we had a couple in new york you knew the ball wasn't going anywhere else especially at the end of the game they were going to take the shot no, ma no matter what but you know holson holzman was the guy you know he was really the guy that put everything together and made everybody you know one unit and one thing I miss about back then, like when the Knicks played these teams, like you guys remember, when they played the Bullets, you had Unseld against Reed and Gus Johnson against the Busher and Jack Marin against Bradley. And I remember losing against the Bullets in a playoff game, and Bradley took the last shot, and I swore it was going in. I cried that night. I thought for sure we're going forward. You know, but there were, there were back then there were real rivalries. You know, and it's not like that anymore, I don't think. These guys are a lot more familiar with the – ins and outs of Holzman, but I just remember that stogie cigar <laughs> in his mouth. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that, that visual has always stuck with me when I think about him. Yeah, yeah. I got to meet him one time. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, Jeff, you know these guys like they're your friends, but yeah, yeah. I, you know, it was such a thrill for me. One time I saw Dave DeBusher. It was like a Monday morning and I was going to work from uh, Brooklyn into Manhattan. And Dave DeBusher is there in the station and he, and he gets on the train. And like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like a well, Monday now, morning, now, yeah. yeah, I was in a bad mood, Monday morning work, and then I see the busher, and it throws me back to these days. But one time I, I was at a game, and uh, it was kind of when I got married. It was sort of between the Bernard King and, and the Ewing area, and Red Holtzman and his wife Selma were in the stands. And I said, man, to my wife, I got to get up the guts to go say hello to this guy and just tell him how much he meant to me. And, and I did, and I went over to him, and I said, you know, see the ball, you know, Coach Holtzman, and a couple words. And he looked at me and he said, I bet you were one of the guys that was booming back in the day. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and he could be stern, as you said, but he, then he just started laughing. And he shook my hand and he made me feel like a million bucks. So, Let's not forget yeah. Danny Whalen, the trainer. Yeah. Because he and his wife, Randy, Danny was a great guy. He actually is the guy who gave Clyde his nickname, mm-hmm. you know, from the, from the Bonnie and Clyde thing. But Danny was the little leprechaun, they used to call him. And he was just a sweet guy. He was a very nice guy. Another, you know, there were so many characters on that team. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. A- a- interesting. And, and you know, there's so many, so many guys that I wish I would have seen in their prime. And and Jeff, you had mentioned the rivalries with the Bullets, and a, a member of the Bullets at that time wasn't a Nick yet. Was Earl the Pearl? Uh, oh yeah. Talk a little bit about the rivalry and 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 what type of basketball play was Earl? What was it like watching Pearl live oh and those Pearl battles was- with the Knicks and Bullets? Listen, they, you know what they call their old black Jesus or black yeah. magic. The guy had more, went to Winston-Salem, couldn't mm-hmm. be stopped. Guy was an awesome offensive player, and he had to change his game to come to New York. But also, mm-hmm. Clyde, like I said, doesn't have a huge ego, but he liked the notoriety and the attention, so they mm-hmm. both had to change. And the ironic thing is, a lot of the events Clyde does in this restaurant, Earl is always there supporting him. Yeah. Because Earl has diabetes like I do. I have type mm-hmm. 2, mm-hmm. and Earl is big. In, in the diabetes thing, but he always shows up for Clyde mm. at the events there. He's a, a great guy. But let me tell you something, I don't think there were many guards that could do the things that he did with the ball. I mean, Clyde was an all-around player, every facet of the game. Like I said, offense, defense, rebounding, and assisting, and demeanor. Or Earl was mostly known for his offense. Wasn't a great rebounder. What Tried on defense. Sure can handle the ball. He had some mm. handle. But when he came to the Knicks, man – I think that's one of the back, best backcourts in NBA history. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Ridiculously good battles. I remember sitting in my room with my radio and listening to Marv, and he's talking about, you know, you know, Pearl spins. He had that great yeah. spinning move, and, you know, mm-hmm. he, gave, he gave Clyde fits, you know, but the battles were unbelievable. And, and you know, as, as Gil said also about, you know, uh, Gus, John, well, Gus Johnson and, and Wes Unsell and Jack Marin. I mean, even Kevin Lockery was, I think, was on the team. Yep. And they, up and down, they had a great lineup. Those were such great battles. They were. And you I, knew they were the physical. Pearl, I do remember that, you know, when they were talking about the trade and the, then the, the Post and everything was writing articles about how are these two guys going to play together? You're going to need two balls out on the court. But you know what? You know, Jeff, as you said, they, they, made, them, they, made, they made it work. And that's why they won another championship. That's but right. They, and they were one of the they were one of the best backcourts. I agree in the history of the game. So they're able to get through the bullets uh, first round, I believe, in in the playoffs, right? So they're able to make it past the Bucks, get to the Lakers, and you have this Laker team with a with a trio of Wilt, uh, Jerry West, and Elgin Baylor. Uh, talk a little bit about the, the matchup between West and Clyde. You know, what was that like in, in the finals uh, during that time? I don't think Clyde guarded West that much, but I remember West mm. hitting that half-court shot and the Bush just falling back and almost cracking his head <laughs> on, the, on the apron. I mean, that was amazing. But listen, man, that was great because you had Gail – don't forget Gail Goodrich. Was Gail Goodrich, that. right, yeah. And, I, and Jim McMillan from Columbia, mm. right? I mean, the Lakers were a great team, but – yeah, it was a great matchup. They gave the Knicks fits. You know, hey, it went seven games and we needed it. Every guy, we needed a miracle from Willis. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys think that, you know, Willis coming out of the tunnel was, was such a monumental moment? Obviously, in my history, not having seen the game, but Clyde's performance of 36 points, 19 assists, seven rebounds. I mean, Jeff, when you're leaving that game, are you thinking, well, of course you think we're, we're the champions, but which one was was – 
you know, kind of the, the shining moment of the game for you? Was it Clyde's you performance know, or was it Willis coming back you know, and, that's a, and going that's back a at great, That's a great uh, question, CP, because we were all emotionally drained by, like Marty said, Willis hitting the two shots and just using everything he had in his body. But I would have to say it was Clyde because he was nonstop. I mean, he did, I mean, you said it, 36 points. 19 assists, seven rebounds. I think he had five steals and playing great defense. I mean, don't forget, I, don't, I can't give you the number. I don't remember Marty or Gil, maybe you remember. I don't remember how many minutes Willis played, but I'm sure he didn't play more than a half. I mean, in total minutes. Clyde must have played a good, I'd say, over 40 minutes, guaranteed. And that, that's, that's a Superman performance. So I would say that Willis's was more emotional, but Clyde's was more, well, I can't say more heroic. You know, that, that's why they're a team, man. Yeah. yeah. You know, they don't, they don't win without Clyde's performance, obviously. Yeah. yeah. What do you guys say? Yeah, I'd agree with that, what Jeff is saying. I think, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the drama that came and emotion that came out of what Willis did, the whole coming out of the tunnel, hitting the first two shots, but it was obvious, and I even remember this, it was obvious he wasn't 100%. And, mm-hmm. and, 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 and that he gave everything he had, but mm-hmm. somebody had to, had to step up and, and take it. And, and obviously Clyde did that and had just a game for the ages. I think that the Lakers were beaten after Willis hit those two shots. Mm-hmm. I mean, at halftime, Knicks were up by like 25 or so. Uh, Jerry West, even, and you know, they, I know that when, I mean, Jeff, you were there at the game, but I remember when, uh, when Willis came out and he was warming up, the Lakers were watching him. Yeah, they turned around and they all watched. Yeah, they were watching him. I think I think emotionally it took a lot out of them. But also, you know what, I know Clyde likes to deflect a lot of the accolades that come his way, but he put up the game of the ages. And he did mm-hmm. it when it really counted. You know, there's a lot of guys that can talk a good game, okay? But when that game, when that apex, that one game that means your career and maybe like the future of the NBA, Clyde was there. And beyond that, it was Clyde's best game of his life, I think. For Willis, it wasn't his best game, obviously, as far as, you know, points or anything, but it was the most important game that he ever played. Yeah. Him to go in there with that cortisone was ridiculous. May 8th, guys, that's the date. May 8th, coming up. Yeah. May 8th, right. coming up, 50th anniversary. And uh, this is really a, a great conversation. You know, when they win it, after they win it uh, in, in 73, did you guys think it was that run was coming to an end? Or did you think that they had more in them? It's a good question as well. I mean, I think that they were getting older. And I think that a lot of the baton was going to be, you know, given to another team because that was just, again, that was a great team of role players. Like you and I, we didn't discuss it, but you had Dean Eminger, who was so good off the bench and against the Celtics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you had other guys. uh, uh, Lucas was on that. As a a player. Jackson. We talked about him. Well, Bill Jackson was not with, like you, like I think Marty said, he was not there in the 69 team, really, 69, 70 for the whole season. Mm-hmm. He was more, uh, he was never a dominant player, but he had, he filled a role. The Knicks yeah. always had role players. Like Martin said, you know, he would come out all arms and legs yeah. and yeah. head and shoulders, <laughs> and he would, you know, he would disrupt people and get them angry. Very cerebral player. Again, a lot of the Knicks were cerebral players. And, but, you know, like I said, my favorite guy, not, Clyde and Earl, without a doubt. But Dean Meminger was a gutsy guy, and you know, I knew him really well. We lost him, I think, last year. I spoke to him three nights before it happened. Dean had a lot of problems with drugs and family, and mm-hmm. it was a sad story. But let me tell you, Dean was an integral part of that team winning, as was Jerry Lucas. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that, that, was, that was a different championship. It wasn't as um, – I guess the first one's always your best, right, guys? Mm-hmm. But that one was not as satisfying, but it was still satisfying. Playing and in answer to your question, yeah, I thought it was about they got as much out of these guys as they could. That's my opinion. What do you guys say? I think out of these guys, they did get as much as they could. I think that Jerry Lucas coming for the next one, Pearl coming for the next one. You know, they had a great team there. I mean, and then, you know, of course, 
Clyde left in, in uh, 77, I think. Well, he didn't leave. They traded him to the Cavaliers, and I was pissed, and he hated it. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, he, he talks about it to this day, Clyde. Yes. Man, it's terrible. Yeah, yeah. But I thought that there would have been more championships, especially here, you know, in New York, especially when free agency came in and guys were starting to build their own teams. You know, New York is still the mecca. There's no place like playing in the garden. We've had bad management. You sure. mentioned, you know, I didn't think Ernie Grunfeld did such a great job. My wife went to high school, so I can't talk too bad about it. Ernie's a good guy. And Bernie <laughs> but, was there as well, so the Tennessee yep. connection. But, um, but I thought they could have had better management. And I think right now we're not in a great place. But, you know, something will happen. And, and I believe that, you know, we're going to see another one. I don't know if it'll be quite like that first one, as you said, Jeff. But, nah. you, know, you know, there's good days ahead, I think. It's a different game now. I mean, like you just brought up a couple of points, and I don't want to do it because we're talking about our 69-70 team, but Dolan mm -hmm. is totally iced out. Marv Albert, who is a legendary icon of this team as well, and he does nothing. And, I, and you read Oakley. You heard what Oakley said, right? That he blames Ewing for the loss to the, to the Bulls, not Charles Smith missing yeah. those dunks. But that's a whole other show, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a huge show. <laughs> oh, boy. I heard that that's, show. <laughs> that's a, oh, yeah. Yeah, Mar Marty, you, you heard the Oakley interview, right? Jeff, I got to send it to you. And, and Gil, I'll send it to you as well. Uh, Gil, how about you? you? You know, you grew up. This was, this was your team growing up as a kid. After 73, did you feel like there was more on the way? Or did you feel like that team had kind of run its course? Well, I think that team had kind of run its course, but I certainly expected more over the, the next few decades than, mm. than have been there. And, yeah. you know, and fortunately I, I lived in, in New York in the city and got to go to a lot of the games during the UN and, and, and uh, John Sparks era, uh, and, uh, you know, with Oakley and, and, and Mason and all those guys. Those are great teams and a lot of enjoyment. And they, uh, they almost did it then. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, yeah, just 93, uh, we made up hats yeah. that had Nick's world champions and t-shirts because <laughs> oh. we had, a, we had a restaurant and we had to end up sending them to God, some third world country. So the kids could <laughs> have them because they were <laughs> no good here. <laughs> yeah. you know, I still have the hat. Oh, oh, man. <laughs> Marty, you got to send me one, man. I'll, I'll put it yeah. up. Uh, well, uh, close, but no way. cigar. Yeah. But I, but I was proud of them, what they did. I mean, Hey, you know, the bulls in Jordan, that's, you know, uh, they, they, they definitely uh, showed up for, for, for all of those matches and, and won, won a, a bunch of them as well. Just oh, those are great battles as well. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. you know. Uh, absolutely. Well, guys, you know, I, I definitely appreciate you guys um, sharing your stories about this team. On our show on Knicks Fan TV, we call guys like you the OGs. And OGs <laughs> That's right. are, are the guys that have been there literally from every moment, every classic moment on down and have endured all the losing since. Well, Jeff, you're, you're kind of like, yeah, not really for you right now, right? But you, you still keep tabs a little no, bit. No, no, I watch I, – as I do – I don't watch games like I used to. I'm not yeah. as excited about it. You know, like we all know what's become of Nick management. It's a farce. I mean, I, I went through the Oakley years and Mason and although JR, I mean, I could tell you mm -hmm. stories. That's other, that's other shows. Yeah, like, it's they all relationships shows with, yeah. with, I mean, I, real, I, don't, I don't know how much time you have left, but I remember <laughs> when the Knicks were playing the Bulls in those famous playoffs, I met my wife and we were dating. Mm. And I told her, I got courtside seats from Bo Kimball. I didn't have my seats mm. anymore. I said, let's go to the game. She goes, do you want to date me? I said, absolutely. Well, I don't want to see a basketball game. <laughs> I said, this isn't a basketball game. This is Michael Jordan. This is the Knicks Bulls. What do you think? We ended up in a bar watching the game anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and Anthony Mason used to come into a place that I ran, and he'd come in right after the game in his uniform. I'd say, Mason, let me ask you something. Don't you think these people know who you are? Couldn't you have like changed? <laughs> I got <laughs> oh man, rest his soul, man. They said, Yeah, he's that a, was he's sad. A yeah. Guy. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's a great guy. guy. Yeah. Great hey, guy. I want to show you this just back to the 70, the 69 70 team. I found this. This is my version of the book. Oh, nice. New oh, York Knickerbockers Championship Season Miracle on 33rd Street. CP, that's fortunately. Unfortunately, 50 years later, the cover's not all there. Yeah, but, that's, uh, that's good. That means it was think, well read. <laughs> I think I'm going to read it. Yeah. Gil, that is a great book. 
Yeah. Do, do you guys remember that? Yeah. yeah I, I, yes, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Great book. Yeah. I was I was proud that I still had it. <laughs> I CP, yeah. I sent you a couple of um things with, with the black and white as we were talking to yeah. you. I sent it to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. About the six, the, the uh, championship game with Willis. Yeah, I, I got to read that one. I had the Garden of when the Garden was Eden. Uh, That's by a great Aaron, book. It was a great, fantastic book, and uh, definitely spurred me to to have this conversation with you guys. So, uh, like I said, guys, definitely appreciate it. Um, and so, I want to wrap up by doing this. If if I just span to each of you guys, if you just want to say like just a message to the 1970 team, you know, congratulations or whatever your, your message is. Um, Gil, let, let's kick it off with you. Sure. Just uh, congratulations, guys. Uh, it's been 50 years since that magical run. Uh, I know it meant a lot to you guys. I know it meant a lot to the city of New York and the NBA, but I guess for me, just want to say it meant a lot to me as well. And, uh, enjoy it and uh thank you again uh marty how about yourself congratulations to you guys yeah i don't think you realize how much you mean to so many people how you how you inspired me showed me that anything's possible even if you're an underdog so thank you and jeff cp you're an og for life don't worry Let's, <laughs> I, hey guys we were supposed to have the party in march but we got put off because of this terrible pandemic we're going through. You gave all of the fellas that are here tonight great memories. I'll never forget it because for me, it was Tuesday and Saturday at the Garden after the game at Harry M. Stevens. And I even went on the road with you guys to the Landover Center in Maryland and to the Forum in LA. You gave me some of my greatest memories. People used to make fun of me because I put on suede pants and a suede jacket to try and dress like Clyde. And, and it's something that I'll never forget, carry with me my whole life, and there's never going to be another team like you guys. You, you just made us so proud as New Yorkers for what you did and the championship you won and the way you played the game. God bless you all, and I hope we can all see you at a, at a future celebration of this great team. Great. Great job, guys. And, and again, uh, you know, for you guys to have seen this and witnesses, I don't know if I'll ever see one. So again, th this is something that I wanted for this channel that can be archived and, and last for a lifetime for people to, to come and learn about uh, who these guys were, your personal stories and what they meant to you. So uh, Gil, Marty, Jeff, thank you so much again. And for everybody watching and listening, if you guys have memories of that 1917, please leave us a comment in the comment section on YouTube or email us, knicksfantv at gmail.com, and we'll be sure to share some of that on our social media channels. So until next time, you guys take care. Peace. Take care, guys. Thanks, CP.